Jessica, how are you? I'm, I'm Brian. It's good to talk Brian, to you. Meet you over Zoom. Woo! <laughs> yes, over Zoom. Right. Well, first off, thank you so much uh, for joining us here on the bridge. We appreciate that. Uh, Impossible Wait, the new album, and the song that we've been playing a lot here on the bridge. And so, uh, it's really just great to have the chance to talk with you. Thank you so much, and thanks for playing the song. It's just been such a really fun season of just hearing stations across the country start to, to play our music more and more. And so thank you. Oh, uh, you're very welcome. No, it's our pleasure. And, and we'll talk about uh, the record as we go on here, but uh, you know, there's, there's quite a bit, I think that we can talk about uh, when it comes to, uh, uh, to the new album and to where you guys are right now in your career. Um, I, I think it's sort of cliche at the moment to sort of, you know, ask you how things are going in the, in the pandemic. And obviously when you made the record, you didn't know, that we were going to be here, or at least you didn't tell us. And, um, <laughs> but I love that title impossible wait, because that's just what we are. Oh, it's what we're all feeling right now. Yes, it is. It's, it's like kind of blows my mind that how applicable that title and that song and this record is, was to this year. And I think that's, you know, part of the reason why we decided to go ahead and release it too. Is it's, I, one of the things that, Peter, my partner who plays drums in the band as well, um, he said, he's like, I don't know if this record is going to be for everybody, but it's going to be for those who need it. And I think that rang true in a really cool way. And so, yeah. Oh, for sure. I mean, that's, you know, we've needed, I mean, I can speak for myself, uh, uh, you know, one who has uh, a, a lot of the anxiety and stuff I know you can side with that, uh, yeah, we've needed a lot of art this year. You know, we've turned to a lot of music and books and movies there's some really great stuff that's come out at exactly the right time. Yeah, I think so too. I, I, I am, I'm excited that I've read a lot more. <laughs> like I may not have written, you know, a boatload of songs. Like I, I was just talking to somebody about like all the artists who maybe didn't feel as prolific as they thought they would, you know, with all this time on our hands, but it's not really all this time on our hands. It's mental energy takes a lot of space too, but mm -hmm. I try to rest my brain and read as much as I can too. Yeah, you know, so it's funny you say that. Um, I, I referred to an earlier conversation we had uh, with Bethany Cosentino from Best Coast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we were sort of talking at the time, all these artists we would talk to would say, oh, are you doing so much right now? You've got so much time on your hands. And, and she was really the first person that was like, hey, pump the brakes. This is a heavy, heavy thing that we're in right now. Give yourself some room to be down a little while. Yeah, Absolutely. I, I definitely granted myself that and tried to spread, spread that gospel as well. So thanks. Well, I, well sure. I, I know that you've actually said before that you, you wish that you were more prolific as a writer, uh, but, but, you know, give yourself some grace in this moment. Yeah, definitely. So congratulations, by the way, on the new album. I mean, um, you know, just, great guitar sounds, awesome melodies, just uh, top to bottom. Uh, I want to talk about you producing the record and what kind of a move that was for you, why you decided to take that step and, and, and kudos to what came out. I mean, congratulations on a great record. Thank you so much. I, I was, a, I think my whole career, I've been in a producing mindset or tried to kind of fit myself into what I thought that mold was, but never really took an official title for it. And I think as in the back of my mind, I was scared to take that official title because that means that the end product really is your end product. Like, I mean, you know, so, some, you, sometimes you can say, well, oh, the production, and that's not how I wanted my song to sound. And so you can kind of not blame the producer or you know, there's always some kind of scapegoat that artists will uh -huh. find. Like, it's like a live show. It's the, it's the guy mixing. It's like, you can put on the best show of your life, but it, he's the last stage, you know, before the sound. You're like, oh, the sound was crap tonight. Oh, it was terrible. <laughs> you messed it up. <laughs> Monitors were all bad. It was terrible. So, but when you're the producer, it's on you. And that's a cool responsibility. I had, I had to change my perspective of just like, this is sweet. This is freedom. And another thing that was freedom is I found a really great co-producer. And I made sure that this person, Andy Park, was somebody that um knew very much i was very upfront about my weaknesses the main one being hey like press stop when i've got the right take don't let me press record again and uh <laughs> how are these arrangements what needs to be tightened like just all like he was so good with the fine details and it really let me get, you know, get elevated with going crazy with sounds and he just got my vision with he also engineered the record and so 
it just like kind of helped me step up into all the things that I have loved doing, even in engineering um, and just understanding the studio can be a very mystifying place for females sometimes because it hasn't been the most welcoming place in the past. And I think that's changing, but um, it was just so much fun to record this record. Yeah. I was, I was wondering what you sort of brought to uh, the studio in the sense of producing, but then on the other hand is like control freaks of the world unite. I can understand uh, that I actually may be satisfying because for what you can say, okay, well, this is what's in my head. Now I'm going to go off on this quest to try to recreate that on, on the record. Yeah. And I was excited that, you know, I definitely had certain kind of signposts that I wanted to get to or landmarks, but it wasn't held so tightly that we couldn't go off the beaten path. And I think that that only really comes when you feel freedom in the studio or else you're like, you've got your like graded out map and you're like, I got to do exactly this. And it was nice to have fleshed out demos before we went in but then to be able to hold them loosely and have fun. Yeah. So were you afraid though at any point of, of coming away and say, well, uh, maybe this doesn't really sound like a deep sea diver record or was that okay to you? Did you kind of give yourself license to, man, we're going to open up this sound. Yeah. I definitely had some moments of when I started writing this particular record, I knew it didn't sound like secrets, which is our last one, which was more brooding, more rock, more mm -hmm. wall of sound. And I love that record, but I was just like, I was really like yearning to kind of rediscover my singer songwriter voice that I think I had been embarrassed about for a while. I don't know why, but it's just like, oh, that that's old, the old Jessica, the old singer songwriter Jessica. And I, not that the band made me in any way, shape or form, like change my songwriting perspective or how I went about things. That was all on me, but I was just like, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to embrace some of my roots that, you know, I grew up listening to Elliot Smith and, you know, even as cliche as the Beatles, there's a song called Switchblade that was very much Paul McCartney inspired. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, I think sometimes indie artists, like we, we get a little too, too cool for school where it's just like, <laughs> you start shunning your influences. And I, I, I didn't want to do that anymore. Yeah, no, it's good to embrace them. And I wanted to ask, you know, physically, you've talked about uh, you even stop smoking and that sort of lets you get to a different vocal range. Uh, you know, how about that? The, the physical transformation as well. Yeah, that was huge. Uh, I was definitely doing my voice a disservice for quite a while. I was never like a really heavy smoker, but it definitely cut down my range by an octave, you know, completely. Mm. and like, um, I think, you know, not only with the actual vocal sound, there's something that was very empowering about quitting smoking. Peter and I, quit at the same time and that was a terrible terrible like six months to a year like we had each other's backs but we were just pissed all the time yeah <laughs> like, i'm just like i don't know how anyone would quit anything in, in quarantine i'm thankful that it wasn't during that time because i think wow bad things would have happened yeah no this is this is the wrong time to try that we'll we'll go ahead and you know give you the pass on that one yeah <laughs> All right, well, we're chatting with Jessica Dobson, the deep sea diver here on 90.9 The Bridge. And I must, uh, you know, explain real quick to the radio audience that we're, this is, uh, now we've done these before, these sort of quarantine conversations as we call them. Uh, but this is the actual first time that we've involved a sort of audience. And so who we have a whole panel of d different little squares here. Uh, these are members of our station who are in supporting the bridge and we allowed them access to uh, this particular interview. So that's, that's who you're playing to today. That's awesome. Hey, everybody. <laughs> have you Can't done anything like this before? Each other, with each other in person. Um, I have done a few things. The last Zoom performance that I did was, funnily enough, uh, run by Sir Mix-a-Lot. Um, Excellent. For, yep. Totally makes sense. It was yes. for um, the benefit of saving some venues in Seattle. Yeah. Yeah. So, um but it's so funny because at the end you know everyone's muted and as you guys should be or else it'll be a bunch of feedback but like you know you play your song and you're like cool <laughs> and like i think they had people like kind of like you know making some kind of waving or something where it felt like a right. show. They unmuted for a second and then muted but whatever <laughs> yeah yeah like, all the things that we've you know had to get used to it's like it's fine I'm, I'm happy to still be doing what i'm doing and it's things are gonna change yeah, well, you know, it's the technology can still bring us together, but I know that for you as musicians, it's it's an unusual turn on on the lack of live performance yeah. right now. Definitely. 
Well, you've got a beautiful studio there, and so let's put it to use uh, for what what we came for. Um, let's hear something. What do you would like to play for us first? Well, I thought I would bring something special. I'm going to turn my reverb back on so it sounds even more lovely. Um, I have. I'm going to debut a song that I haven't played from the record in an acoustic form. I, we've never even played this song live. Um, wow. Because on our last tour, yeah, we this this song's called Lightning Bolts. It's towards the end of the record, and yeah. um, originally the song was written on piano. I believe it was more like a ballad, and then it became like one of the poppiest songs on the record, kind of Talking Heads ish. But this is my Smiths Johnny Marr version of it. So hopefully you guys enjoy it. This is we'll Lightning love that. Bolts. All right. Nice. Everything sound okay? It sounded amazing. Awesome. That was incredible. Yeah, that was really great. Thank you, guys. <laughs> Jessica Dobson, Deep Sea Diver at Lightning Bolts comes off of Impossible Weight, the new album uh, that we're chatting with her right now from uh, her studio in, uh, in Seattle. We're here on a virtual 909 session. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about I was going back, uh, I was looking at interviews, reading stuff like from your old records, and I was really kind of doing the deep dive. And uh, uh, you gave one interview right when Secrets came out. I believe that record was sort of delayed. Uh, it was supposed to come out in like October of the year. It came out the following February. And in this particular interview, you said, man, I am a really impatient person. And so I was wondering how that sort of squared with where we are in the pandemic. And if you had any thought about 
oh man, you know, do I put this record out now or do I wait for this again? How did, how did that whole uh, thing reconcile? Yeah, gosh, when I look, when I look back and think about like secrets, that was a matter of months, not with, you know, no end date in sight. It's so different now. Like, um, I mean, now, like, thankfully there's a vaccine, but yeah, when we first decided to do this, it was like, I don't know. Uh, it, it was like, what's the alternative? Kind of just guess that it might come out in a year from now, you know, because there was, mm -hmm. there was, sorry, my mic was falling over. Um, yeah, like it was either take a gamble and release it or take another gamble and see if this pandemic lasts for years and years, like, you know, and it just felt right to release it this year. And, um, you know, also too, for a band like us, that is, you know, a bit smaller than most in like, the mainstream world like it also gave us an opportunity to maybe be noticed a little bit more so you know there's a little less noise but um that's not the main reason we decided to do it but I also yeah too well i can you know I, look again i can imagine it must be tough you're sitting on something that you're proud of that's you're waiting for it to go out the door and you know i can understand that that would be uh, an impatient part of the process i would be the same way yeah. so i get it totally you know, it, I'm like sorry. Second. No, I, I'm just I'm thinking about this next year. It's like, you know, I still hold that impatience. It's like, oh, my God. You know, I, I, the Madrid is one of the last places we played, you know, before yeah. everything shut down. We were on tour with Joseph, and I have no idea what touring is going to look like this coming year, you know, even if right. uh, they just do open back up again. And uh, it's like the, the thing that weighs heavy on me is like, oh, man, but like, I don't like we didn't definitely didn't get the proper cycle of touring on this record and you know maybe we will in the future but it's it's all frankensteined out now but every everybody's in the same boat so i can't complain yes yes we're all just zoom calls now we're <laughs> <laughs> we're all just zoom and that's how it's going to be for the moment i was wondering and I, I actually scribbled this down i was wondering though if this had uh if this method of promoting an album was in some ways easier you can get to more places you can talk to more people maybe you can i don't know do you open up a little more like how do you feel about this technological method of a promotion i know it's not perfect and you don't want to tour like this but yeah. does it accomplish some things does it i think that it definitely was helpful for like the podcasting world of things i think that's where you can get a little bit more into the meat um you know versus if you're doing a really quick interview and you're running into an institute like um pot i mean everyone loves podcasts now i list the, i listen to them all day you know or not all day i do other things but <laughs> <laughs> no of, it's okay it's <laughs> <laughs> um i never sleep uh okay yeah. wait true crime or what are you listening oh, yeah. to sure. <laughs> of course like, yes well like Peter hates me because I'll wake up in the middle of the night to put on another podcast to put myself as I need, I'm like addicted to podcasts and it's like my favorite murder case file. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's bad. But, um, you know, okay. But Baltimore, see, here's how that translates now because my wife's into that too. And she now tells me if, if you make me mad, I know how to do this. Right. And I know how to make you disappear. So please, yeah, everybody know out there, if I do disappear, you know what happened. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> But, uh, I, you know, in long form podcasts, like, you know, you are able to talk for longer and a lot more. And I, I have really enjoyed that. Um, what I deeply miss is, you know, for a lot of things, they're pre-taped now, like where you would traditionally, like, I love that this is live right now and I get to talk to you. Mm -hmm. and there's an energy that, um, you know, you step into when you're on tour and you're going to a radio station and there's people there or a, doing a tiny desk or whatever it is, yeah. you're stepping into that places energy yep. and when it, you know you're doing things only from home like I love my studio but you know when I'm having to tape something and record it at the same time and like you don't you're not allowed a second chance when you go into the studio as well you know for you guys when people come in it's like you, it sounds what it sounds like you play the song and you do your best and for me it's like a nightmare when I start getting in my head I'm like did that sound good nope hundred takes later, just like, oh! <laughs> so, uh, there's so many things I miss about, um, touring and like, you know, even though it is exhausting, I am an extra, 
an absolute extrovert and I love stepping into the energy of other places. And so, yes, we can go more places, ironically, from being home, but I prefer the former. Yeah. It's that working without a net. That's what makes it so fun. Yeah. Even just being on live radio, it's like, oh, are they going to curse? Are they going to say something crazy? What's going to, yeah. what are they going to play? <laughs> That's the beauty of it. Totally. Like the only thing that can like really like shock anyone right now is if my dog stands up and like starts peeing on my lips. <laughs> Don't do that, Henry. My <laughs> dog. I mean, I don't uh, know that'd be one heck of a video. Being very, very, very calmly behind me. <laughs> Uh, I wanted to, and again, we're chatting with Jessica Dobson here from uh, Deep Sea Diver on 90.9 The Bridge. <clears throat> so I want to ask you, uh, you seem to me to be one of these people, and maybe this is not it, but I sort of get this, that you speak in terms of color quite a bit, and you've described some things as being colorless. Uh, you described, I believe, Secrets as being the red album, and an Impossible Weight as being green. Will you explain what that means? Will you, will you tell us how you see that? Yeah, so this is different than like a Weezer thing where the actual cover, you know, they have the green album. You don't actually mean the red yeah. album, right? Yeah, totally. Um, or the Beatles, the white album. It's different. It's more of uh, how the, the album makes me feel and the textures. Um, so this one, I think because it was written from starting out from one of the lowest times in my life, uh, dealing with depression, and anxiety, and questioning pretty much everything I was doing and not knowing how I was going to continue in my own musical career. Um, I had to set a color before myself, which was green. And the word that came along with that was resplendent, full of life, full of color. Cause I wasn't feeling those things. And so I was like, well, I can either crawl into a hole and hide from my friends and uh, do a disservice to myself, or I can set some goals before me and colors are very directive for me. So I did that. And it's funny because when I listen to this record, it's not like, I don't see it like, um, this is kind of more literal example, like another green world, Brian, Eno. that record is very much, even though it has the name green in the title, like it's alive and it's all these things. Mm -hmm. Like, I feel like it's a bridge between secrets, like, um, where there are some brooding moments, but there's like these different kinds of pops of energy and color. And, you know, there's, we leaned a little more into the pop side and that was something that kind of scared me, but that should be a good thing. I think. Yeah. So, yeah. I was, I was just wondering, you know, what color sort of meant to you. I know that there are people who sort of see, visualize things in like an aura. If you, if you saw other things outside of music as colors. You know, what's the word for that? Um, I, I don't have that. Uh, there's a specific word for people that, that is, uh, attribute sound with every sound to, to different colors. Mm -hmm. I don't have that gifting or I don't know if it, I can't, I don't know the right term for it, but um, so maybe one of you, synesthesia. Yep. Thank you. Um, I don't have that, but I, uh, doesn't mean that I don't use it. Yeah. We would love to uh, hear another song at this point. Uh, what would you like to play for us now? This one's called Wishing. All right. Oh yeah. Got to turn my reverb back on so I can sound saintly for you all. Okay, here we go. Not want to admit it, first want to deceive. My recollections are a one way street. Slide into the
Wishing from uh, Deep Sea Diver off of Impossible Weight, their latest album here on 90.9 The Bridge, our virtual 909 session with Jessica Dobson. It was really great. Thank you very much. It's, uh, it's fun to play these songs acoustic. Um, you know, that one's very much more like a kind of M83 heavy on the synthesizer song on the record. And so it's nice. I'm glad they stand up, you know, just me and my old guitar. Do you compose primarily on, do you compose on guitar first or you've composed on piano, obviously, as you said? Both. I find that I actually write a lot faster when I compose on keys um, because you're kind of just, I don't get distracted. Like with guitar, especially if I'm playing on electric, I go down all these rabbit trails of like, well, what if I put delay? What if I put reverb? What if I do this? And piano, I just kind of have, you know, I try to stick with like some pretty simple patterns and blocked chords and i think that the melody then is able to you know carry everything and, and, and instead of like playing this fancy guitar part and having a lesser than melody um yeah i try to always make sure that the melody is equally as good yeah let's let's talk about your tools of the trade for one moment because uh, i've seen some interesting stuff uh and i love that you say that you're not you're not a gearhead, but uh, everybody always wants to talk about your guitars and everything about that. So um, your, your jazz master, your Elvis Costello guitar. Yes, I'm looking at it. <laughs> Tell us about uh, your primary instruments here. Well, uh, so I do, I am known for playing jazz masters and that particular one, the Elvis Costello is so beautiful. It's, it's, I wish I could, re it's a little out of reach for me right now. I'm afraid I would knock all, over all my mics if I tried yeah. to get Something bad would happen. Um, but uh, the roof would cave in. Um, that guy is, is like this beautiful walnut finish and it feels good, you know, for guitar. Like I'm not, I say that I'm not a gearhead because, you know, e even though that's like a more of a limited guitar, I didn't buy it knowing that. It was just like, I just thought it sounded and looked cool. But I have a vintage guitar that's not my primary and most of my guitars aren't vintage. And so when I say I'm not a gearhead, it mostly means I'm not an elitist. Um, yeah. And, you know, with my studio, I make do with what I have, you know, I don't own a ton of outboard gear, like, it's frankly too expensive for me. So I just like try to make do with, um, you know, gather things along the way. But um, this I bought, I was glad that I bought this early on in my career, I think I was like 20. And I used to live in LA and Hollywood, they had this, it's like a 1972 Gibson Hummingbird. And I've dropped it many times. I'm so sorry. Mm -hmm. hummingbird. <laughs> uh, but it's still good to me. Um, but yeah, like I, I think I also say that I'm not a gearhead too, to stop myself from going into that like ultra geeky forum world of like, where I only think and talk about gear and the songs come second. I don't want to go there. So. Yeah. Yeah. But you know, and there are a lot of people that want to jump to that, but I, this may be the part uh, of the conversation where we bring up your resume. And in addition to deep sea diver, of course, you have toured and been a part of the shins and back in the yeah, yeah, yeahs. And I, you know, I just wondered if, uh, so you start off with a particular guitar because maybe that's accessible to you. What did you pick up from those other groups? Because they don't, they're not always going to have that sort of tone. And they're going to maybe introduce you to new equipment, new styles, new things. Did you bring anything from those other groups? Oh yeah. So like in terms of gear. Sure. Uh, I mean, I definitely, with the shins, um, that was kind of my foray into like these old silver tone Jupiter guitars and super Fender super reverbs. Cause James Mercer is like a big Smiths fan and like, um, loves a lot of Brit pop. And so like that is kind of more chimey and, uh, but like, yeah, it, like a lot of reverb and things like that with Beck that was more experimental effects. And, you know, he's like, he has so many records that span over decades, you know? Yeah. I mean, I literally, it was so, such a trip when I started playing with him because I like learned how to play guitar, learning his songs in junior high. Oh, wow. <laughs> so it's yeah. like pretty crazy, you know, playing loser and all these things. And, um, and so, yeah, I know I definitely took something from everybody because I was forced into like, like getting into their heads to make sure that I was doing their songs justice when we play them live. And then I would take the things I learned. I say, it's just a bunch of osmosis. Like I, in my bones, I just wrote James, actually, I sent him a record and um, I, I told him, I was like, there are pieces of you in this record, man. Like songs like hurricane and just the playfulness and eyes are red, the out extended outro. We used to do this thing 
for the Shin song one by one where we play sometimes five, 10, 15 minute outros on it and just jam. And like, <laughs> I really miss that. But it like freed me up in my own songwriting to be like, oh, why isn't there a 10 minute jam on my songs? I'm yeah. just going to put it on a record. Who cares? <laughs> so thanks, James. Yeah. Well, I, and I've heard you talk about that, how, uh, you know, maybe the shins kind of let you paint a little bit more. And then Beck yeah. was very, you know, very tight. Like we've got a lot of stuff to get through. It's a very Ooh, tight set. Songs. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Crazy. Take us into the audition room. What, what is it like auditioning for Beck? How do you get that job? Well, my friend was the musical director and he had reached out to me not to try out, not that he didn't want to try out, but I had never made myself available as a session musician or a touring musician. I had my own band and he was like, Hey, we're looking for, you know, a band to put together. Um, send me all your recommendations. Cause he knew I had a lot of friends in LA. So I sent them off. And then like the whole week I like couldn't sleep because I was just like, at the time I was on a major label. I was trying to get off. I was very bummed out with the situation and I wasn't really playing a lot of music. And I was like, why i just for fun i should go try out so went to sar which is a rehearsal space in los angeles and uh the first one i don't even think he was there it was just videotaped but like i brought my vintage jaguar to try to have some street cred (laughs) okay yeah it's an old fender guitar electric and i poured myself into practicing for because they gave learn these three songs and so i didn't sleep for like three days i just locked myself in the studio and did that and bought a bunch of effects and tried to emulate that sound and anyways i got three callbacks and then on my 22nd birthday they were like do you want to go tour the world yeah wow. i was like crazy <laughs> but it was a crazy experience because i was trying out with different people each time and you know if like the bass player wasn't very good or it's the worst one the drummer isn't very good you're just like oh this whole <laughs> band sounds like crap right now but i hope it <laughs> like, doesn't reflect on me but whatever um but yeah it was wild because i had never done anything like that and i really didn't think i was gonna get the job because i was up against all these crazy studio musicians you know but that's incredible. And yeah, it's even wow. worse when the drummer's your husband, right? And you're like, come on, you're bringing me down, <laughs> man. We got to go. That would have been fine, actually, if Peter was on tour. But maybe we probably would have killed each other. <laughs> uh, you were raised in Los Angeles, and uh, you kind of grew up there until moving to Seattle, right? And yeah. um, you've talked about how music was sort of part of your life from you were young. You're, you're in the car, you're sing, kind of singing along. And what was, what was that growing up like? What was around you musically? Around me musically was, you know, it's funny. Like I, uh, a lot of the formative years of my life were spent in youth group, which is the only place I had access to musical instruments. And so like, yeah my parents like raised me in the church and like I loved going to youth group because I got to play the drums. <laughs> and so like, you know, I didn't have drums at my house and I, my dad had an acoustic guitar, a 12 string Takamini. And so like, that's the easiest way um, to learn songs. It's because like in the church, like worship songs are like these simple three chord songs that yeah. you know, that's how I learned the basics. And then I started, you know, <laughs> crappy. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Raise yep, your hand. Yep. Went to youth group. Um, and then, And then I started these, you know, silly little punk bands in my garage and, you know, started getting my own taste and uh, in in music. And because I loved my parents' record collection. They had all the classics, Simon and Garfunkel, The Zombies, Led Zeppelin, you know, those kinds of things. And so I grew up on that music. But um, yeah, no, uh, the youth group songs weren't satiating for me. So (laughs) like... (laughs) <laughs> but I started going to Amoeba every Sunday and buying records and talking to, yeah. like that was the most fun thing that I miss so badly about this time. It's just like, um, and in the digital world now with streaming, it's just like, I miss seeing people and being like, do you have this record? Oh, you should you listen to this mixtape or, you know, spin mag used to release these compilations like on CD and just playing a CD from front to back and just discovering, you know, yeah. and, and so there, a lot of that kind of, yeah, discovering spirit was in the air of me, me growing up and, and sharing records with other people. Yeah, as with so many. And uh, right, I can still rock a good church hymn. I mean, that's where a lot of us first learned to totally. knock out some chords. Oh, yeah. And the huge difference between the youth group songs, between hymns, which are, you know, classically composed and really rich. I grew up, you know, uh, classically trained pianist for seven years. And um, I always loved learning uh, yeah, those will just like very well, it doesn't, you know, whether you like the lyrics or not, just that's a good song. 
Yeah. 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 Well, there's a reason we still sing it thousands of years later, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and now if I can, it, you know, this, this was, as it turns out, your adoptive family, right? Your, you actually just found your birth mother. I did. Yeah. Uh, it took me, you know, 30 years and it was crazy because I had never seen a photo of her. I knew her name, but um, I didn't know anything about her. And so upon meeting her, I found her on Facebook, which is, it's a crazy story. Um, but <laughs> God bless Facebook. Uh, and she just shows up in people you might know or. Yeah. No, it's a long story, <laughs> but a crazy miraculous. One. But anyways, uh, yeah. So like to have this access to all these photos and videos after knowing nothing, you know, and being like, wow, I look just like her. That's crazy. Mm. There was a, you know, I, I never felt like I had a hole to fill because I had such great parents, but you know, with everyone and their identity, you know, these it's, you know, things would linger in my mind of just, you know, what is nature versus nurture or, you know, what, what is my heritage, all these things. And so a lot of the things were answered in the last few years, which is really cool and comforting. And, and I, you know, I got to have a new friend. Yeah. Well, I, you know, you always talk so lovingly about sort of both sides there, your, your adoptive family and what they've given you. And I think that's, that's awesome. Is, oh, yeah. will the experience with your birth mom, will that show up in your art somewhere down the road? I think it's too early to say. Um, I would love to spend more time with her. Mm -hmm. I've really only had a couple of times to hang out in California. And I, you know, I haven't even seen my own family this entire year. So, yeah. um, but yeah, like, I, I'm de I mean, I'm not close off to it. Yeah. Well, if we can have uh, one more song from yeah. Impossible Weight, that would be amazing. Why don't we do the title track? Let's do it. I love it. Okay. Reverb one more time. How's everybody doing? I like, okay. I'm just trying to envision that I'm at the Madrid right now. That was a fun show. Um, <clears throat> it was anybody there that's in the chat right now? Oh, let's see. Right. Um, somebody raise a virtual hand if you were. Mm -hmm. How many people are here right now? I, I'm only seeing a few windows. I think it says 23. So nice. there are, yeah, probably at least 20 people here. Awesome. Thank you guys for joining. And, uh, you know, again, thank you guys for playing our record and for showing us some love this year. All right. This is Impossible Wait.
just then and this is now I tried so hard not to let you all down it's an impossible way so I'll just set you down now ooh ooh wow thanks everybody yes that uh, again was amazing jessica dobson of deep sea diver and impossible wait for us here on 90.9 the bridge that was incredible again just thank amazing you. performance thank you brian i really appreciate it thank you everyone for sticking around i'm sorry uh henry didn't make an appearance into the that's my dog but next time <laughs> that's okay that is all right um i wanted to say about that song in particular um first off obviously on the record sharon van Etten is part of that how did you pull Sharon into the project? Oh man, what a gift. Um, I was a Sharon fan for a long time and it just so happened that her brothers were fans of our band. And I think kind of along the line over the last couple of years, maybe had sent her our records or whatever. And so we were on her radar, but we hadn't quite, quite crossed paths yet. And then I ended up going to a show of hers on her Remind Me Tomorrow tour. And I had, um, I had messaged her, I like posted a story that was like, there's no place I would rather be than the show the night before we finish our record. Then the next day was when we finished this song. And uh, in the studio, I had said to my producer, I was like, oh, man, I wish Sharon could sing the song. Like I could totally hear it. And I was just still on, you know, cloud nine from going to that show because it was so good. She's incredible. And, uh, and then that day she messaged me and was like, hey, I want to connect and blah, blah, blah. And then eventually I asked her, if um she wanted to sing on the song and she wow. resonated with it so the art of asking it's like it's you know it's scary it's like i had only been in situations where i had asked people that i like knew really well hey do you want to sing on this come on over like blah 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 and to ask somebody that you respect so much um but you know it's easy to forget that we're, you know it's like we're all we're peers but like i don't i try not to put people on on pedestals but um I don't know. It was just such a gift that she resonated with it. Yeah. No, that's amazing. And, and I have to imagine that you, you're absolutely right. I mean, it's like, uh, uh, you know, walking that fine line of, uh, do I ask? Do I send a, a note? Or what do I do? How do I get this done? Totally. And, and it's funny because I, I asked somebody else uh, to sing on a different song. And I won't say who this person was. And they said no. And it was so respectfully. And mm -hmm. like, you know, it's just like, you just, you never know. You have to put yourself out there. And yeah. Um, and not expect anything hold it loosely because you know there are people that ask me to sing on things and i'm like i love the song but i don't know what i would add to it you know when do we get the sir mix a lot collaboration ah, it's already in the mix just kidding <laughs> waka, waka, waka. We, we play you our demos hold on <laughs> yes exclusive live stuff <laughs> uh you know jessica i can't even tell you what a treat this was on so many different levels. By the way, uh, Rochelle from the text uh, chat says uh, she saw you at Riot Room in May of 2013. So that goes way back. Oh, that was like our first show there. That's crazy. Or in, in, in town. And I remember that. And uh, so many people just expressing love for live music and how much we all miss it. And this really, yeah, boy, this filled a need in the void that we have all had in the back of our minds. So uh, really appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. All right. And when things get back to quote unquote normal, hope to see you in KC, get you into the studio. We'll do all the fun stuff with you that we can do live and in person someday when, when that is back. Uh, but in the meantime, of course, as always, be safe and be well. Thank you. You as well. Look forward to seeing you in person. Yeah. Thank you so much. Ladies and gentlemen, Jessica Dobson, Deep Sea Diver.